<laughs> um, I'll be presenting a literature review on my master's project, which is titled APT Imaging in a Machine Learning Scheme, a novel approach to the diagnosis and treatment of glioblastoma. So firstly, I'll give a brief introduction on a few areas of research. So amide proton transfer, commonly abbreviated as APT, is an emerging MRI technique which provides different image contrast to conventional MRIs. It was first published in a scientific journal in 2003, so it's quite new. This is the general structure of an amide. Amides are found in the backbones or side chains of proteins in our cells, uh, in tumor cells, and um, are related to cellular proliferation. Glioblastomas, as we know, are highly malignant, and because of this, they will have a high protein concentration. This is good for APT imaging because the contrast on the images correlates with the concentrations of proteins in the cells. So areas of hyperintensity on the images um, relate to the existence of a tumor there. So a brief explanation of the physics behind it. The proteins in tumor cells have hydrogen atoms attached to them. Um, these are, can also be thought of as just protons. These protons transfer and exchange with the hydrogen atoms on the water molecules that surround it. We've, so the first step is to measure the normal water signal due to using magnetic resonance techniques. Then we apply a radio frequency pulse at the amide hydrogen's resonant frequency and the protein, uh, sorry, and the hydrogen atoms become saturated. So just here, so it's saturated. And when these saturated protons exchange with the protons on the water molecules, the water signal decreases. It's here. We can use this decrease in water signal to correlate to the concentrations of proteins in cells. So this will give us an indication of the amount of tumor there and the, act the activity of the tumor. Now for machine learning. The field of artificial intelligence relates to machines that can mimic human intelligence. This means that um, they can perform tasks that require cognitive functions, such as learning and problem solving. For example, self-driving cars can sense their environment and um, use problem solving to move safely. Personal digital assistants, such as Siri, Google Assistant, and Alexa, can, de can decipher human speech within an array of sounds in the room and can help you with tasks such as searching the web for information, um, setting alarms, and setting appointments for you. Uh, movie streaming platforms such as Netflix can give you movie recommendations based on your past choices and preferences. So these are all examples of artificial intelligence in our lives today. There are many medical applications as well, which I'll get into soon. Now, machine learning is a subfield of artificial intelligence. Um, this field rela relates to machines that can improve by themselves automatically without explicit programming. The way they do this is by creating a mathematical model. Um, and when they extract features from input, input information, they apply weights to each of the features to create the, bless, the best classification or prediction model possible. So this is a flowchart of what I've just said. Um, and then when we put new data into this classification or prediction model, it will give us an output. So it will classify the images for us, or it can predict something for us. The benefits of machine learning are that it's fast, it's reproducible, um, which means it will always give the same output every time we give it information. Um, this with humans, you know, you can get different opinions between different clinicians, um, that sort of thing. It can analyze a huge data set, and it can also extract hidden information. So this means that um, it might, might be unseen by the human eye. So my research, as Suki has mentioned earlier, relates to APT, GBM, as well as machine learning. There's currently no literature that combines all three fields. Um, from what I've found, they've only, I've only found studies that have used APT and GBM or machine learning and GBM. So I hope to fill in this gap in the middle, um, but for now I'll be talking about some of the studies that I've found. So 
So firstly, APT MRI in GBM treatment. People, um, researchers have used this to grade tumors, to distinguish between progressive disease and pseudoprogression, and determining the IDH mutation status of the tumor cells. So I'll go through each one, one by one. Currently, we use gadolinium enhanced MRIs to grade tumors into the four grades. The issue with this is that some high-grade gliomas do not demonstrate gadolinium enhancement, or it doesn't demonstrate as much enhancement as we expect. Some low-grade gliomas demonstrate um, over-enhancement. And thirdly, some patients cannot be administered the gadolinium contrast due to contraindications. This study by Zhao et al. in 2013 uh, imaged a patient with high-grade glioma. So as you can see on the left, that's the gadolinium enhanced image, and there is no regions of hyperintensity um, at the tumor region, which is signified by the red arrow. Whereas on the right, that's the APT image, and there's a clear region of hyperintensity. This is a patient with low-grade glioma, and on the left we see there is quite a lot of enhancement, more enhancement than we expect of a low-grade glioma. However, on the APT image, um, there is only little enhancement, which indicates it's a low-grade glioma. So this shows us that APT images, um, have, APT images are superior to gadolinium-enhanced uh, conventional MRIs in cases where the patient um, doesn't show enhancement such as these. Now, APT MRI to distinguish between true progression and pseudoprogression. Currently, what we use is just conventional MRIs. The issue with this is that radionecrosis, inflammation, and edema can appear as a tumor on these images. And it's hard to, to, to tell the difference. Patients with suspected recurrence are then sent for a biopsy um, to, to, confirm the active, to confirm the cancer. This is invasive, time-consuming, and introduces risks with this procedure. So this study by Ma et al, published in 2016, um, shows a patient with true progression. So this, the first three images are conventional MRIs, and the last one is the APT image. So on here we can see that the tumor is very evident, which is what we expect. On the APT image, we also get hyperintensity in that region. However, for a patient with pseudoprogression, it also looks like a tumor in these images. However, in the APT image, we don't see much hyperintensity there. Um, so this shows that APT, again, um, is able to distinguish between true progression and pseudoprogression better than gadolinium enhanced images. Thirdly, APT for determining the IDH mutation status of tumors. IDH is a gene found, um, a gene that codes for protein production. So patients with a normal IDH gene will create a normal protein. This means that their cells will function as normal and um, will continue to live. So these patients are called IDH wild type. Patients with a mutated IDH gene will create abnormal proteins or no proteins at all. This means that um, the cell won't be able to function as well as it could and die, which is good in the case of cancer. These patients are called IDH mutant patients. Current methods to determine the IDH mutation status are biopsy or MR spectroscopy, which is a relatively new technique and has been researched um, at the moment but the issue with this technique is that it requires quite a large tumor volume. Um, so this limits the clinical applications. This paper by Pesh et al. in 2018 um, imaged patients with conventional MRIs as well as APT. Um, so what they did was they got an experienced neuroradiologist to segment the tumor region in, from these scans. And once they knew where the tumor was, they, they calculated the signal intensities in these APT images. Uh, we won't worry about what these stand for, uh, but if you're interested, that's what DNS stands for. 
Um, but basically, these scans are derived from the APT scans, just through mathematical filters, um, and that's how they're made, in order to provide different contrasts to the MRI, uh, to the APT scan. They found uh, that, so they used the signal that they've calculated at the tumor region on these scans to classify the tumor as either IDH mutant or IDH wild type. They found that the best image was the DNS APT image um, and resulted in 98% accuracy for predicting, uh, for determining the IDH mutation status. Now I'll be talking about machine learning in glioblastoma treatment. So it's been used to grade tumors, distinguish between true progression and pseudo progression, predict survival of patients, as well as predict recurrence. This 2019 study used uh, T2-weighted MRIs. They used over 500 images and used two artificially intelligent classifiers to grade the tumors into the four grades. Um, these stand for that, but we won't go into how they work today. Uh, the significance of this, of this um, machine learning algorithm is that it was able to extract over 2,000 imaging features, uh, some of which were undetectable by the human eye. This is a block diagram of their classification system. So the MR images were put into a pre-processing stage where they, where they stripped the skull from the images and then went through segmentation and data augmentation and then into the, the artificially intelligent classifiers, which then predicted the grade of the tumors. The result of this study was 93% accuracy for the Winsherm tool and 97% accuracy for the deep neural network tool. This, um, these values could possibly be um, even larger if we were to use APT imaging due to the high contrast. Um, this 2018 paper by Jang et al. Um, tried to use uh, machine learning techniques to distinguish between true progression and pseudo progression. They used a combination of images and clinical features uh, which are these, so those were the clinical features that they used. And they used these as variables in their artificially intelligent um, model in order to classify the tumor as true progression or pseudo progression. This, was, um, this is new because they, they are one of, the f one of the only studies to have combined like imaging features and clinical features. The so this is a confusion matrix um, which shows their results. So on the diagonal, just here, it shows the proportion of successful classifications. So 75% of the images that they classified as pseudoprogression was actually pseudoprogression. And um, although 25% of the images that they classified as progressive disease was pseudoprogression, so that's where they were wrong. The result of this study was 74% accuracy. Again, this could be increased if, we, if they were to use APT imaging. Uh, machine learning for predicting survival. The, this study used many different conventional MRIs, and they used this artificially intelligent classifier in order to predict um, the survival of patients as either long, medium, or short. Long was defined as survival for over 18 months since the first diagnosis, and short was defined as survival for less than six months. Um, they combined many different features and determined the optimal combination of the features, as well as weightings, to, to classify the patients um, on their survival. They used retrospective data to, to create these survival curves for the patients. Um, what they did was they grouped each of the patients based on the data they already had um, into long, medium, and short survival. And then they create, they, and so each curve corresponds to, so this one corresponds to short survival, medium, and then long. They used the artificially intelligent machine to, to create a value for each of the images. This value was called the Survival Prediction Index, or the SPI, which, um, which correlates to the, the survival time as well. So a low SPI value would mean the low, 
short survival, and a high SPI value would mean long survival. So, for example, uh, for a patient with low SPI, their survival at, let's say, 15 months is about 12%. Their chance of survival is about 12%. And if the patient had a medium SPI, their chance of survival at 15 months was about 44%. And for a high SPI, it was about 85%. The accuracy of their predictions was 80%, which is pretty good. Uh, machine learning for predicting recurrence. This, paper, this study used um, these images and this artificially intelligent predictor. They, their hypothesis was that they could detect differences in signal intensity on apparent diffusion coefficient maps as well as flare images months before the tumour showed up or the recurrence occurred. The significance of this study is that if we can anticipate tumor recurrence, this could facilitate preemptive intervention, such as extended surgical resection, extended radiation field mapping, or adjustment of the chemotherapy regimen, if we already know that the tumor is going to come back anyway. So they used preoperative MRIs and put it through the machine learning algorithm, uh, which outputted a predictive infiltration map. So regions of high likelihood of recurrence showed up as red on this map, and low likelihood of recurrence showed up as blue. Then six months later, they took follow-up MRIs, and as we can see in the case of this patient, the region of the tumor recurrence matches with the region of the highest likelihood of recurrence predicted by the machine learning algorithm. They were 74% accurate in their predictions. Now, some challenges with APT and machine learning include artifacts near air tissue interfaces, ventricles, or cysts um, can show up as hyperintense on the APT images. So this was an image from one of my first slides. And as we can see by the white arrow here, um, it shows very high intensity. This is not a tumor. It is just a sinus-related image artifact. This issue can be addressed by using APT in combination with conventional MRIs, not just APT alone. Secondly, the scan time for APT imaging is quite long. So it's about five to ten minutes. However, methods are being researched at the moment to decrease scan time. And with machine learning, uh, we, have, we need fast processing times. This could be addressed by using something like a supercomputer, with very high processing times. And we also need very good quality and a high quantity of input images to train the model and then to test it before it can be um, used in clinics. So this is uh, my research map. I'm currently in my master's. I'll be doing that for two years. And we, we need to just collect data. Um, so we collect preoperative MRIs and other information. And from what I've heard, we get about 100 new glioblastoma patients a year at Charlie's, uh, which would be good. And then the outcome I hope to achieve is a machine learning algorithm which can analyze pretreatment scans and then create a di diagnostic report, which could tell us the tumor grade and the IDH mutation status. And then in my PhD, I hope to, so we need to collect data so post-operative MRIs as well as use the pre-operative ones. And then I can create a diagnostic report and a follow-up report, which can possibly tell us these things. Um, I'd like to thank the University of Western Australia, Sir Charles Gardner Hospital, and the Medical Physics Research Group, as well as my supervisors, Dr. Suki Gill, Dr. Mike Bynavelt, Dr. Martin Ebert, and Dr. Pejman Roshan Farzad for all their help so far, as well as um, their support and guidance to come. Thank you, everyone.